in 1994, uh, he was knighted for his service, services to science and was appointed to the Order of Merit in 2000. Please help me welcome uh, Sir Roger Penrose. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> this talk mentions before the Big Bang. Now, I should explain that if somebody had asked me the question, what happened before the Big Bang, about six months ago, I would have given the conventional answer to that question. And if you want to know what the conventional answer to that question is, well, you should have heard Stephen Hawking in what we, in our country we have a thing called the Richard and Judy show, you probably never heard of that, but what you have heard of is, is the analog that you, you over here which is the Opera Winfrey show. I think that's about as close we get to it. And he gave the answer, well the Big Bang, that is a singularity and the whole notion of space and time ceases to have meaning at that stage and so it makes no sense to ask the question. Of course, he must have prepared that answer because it takes him about 20 minutes to, to say something that long. But uh, let me, whoops, I hope this is going to go on or we're in trouble. Right, here we are. Oh, is that on? Perhaps it just takes a while. <laughs> Hmm. It doesn't look very on to me. <laughs> I know there's another bulb in here, but maybe it just takes a while. I'll use this one to begin with. Let me first describe the, uh, what were the original cosmological models according to Einstein's theory of general relativity. These models were produced by a Russian mathematician or mathematical physicist called Friedman and there were basically three versions depending upon the value of a thing k which tells you the spatial curvature. You see what I, in all these pictures time goes up from the bottom to the top and at the beginning we have this red splodge here which stands for the Big Bang and you see the universe goes on expanding as time increases as you go up the page. And basically the difference between these three models, oh the other one's looking good now, the difference between these three models is the curvature of the spatial part of the geometry. You see these space-time pictures, so time's going up the page and going across we have the nature of space at any one time. So we think of the geometry in this case here, k equals zero, that means the curvature of space, that's the spatial part of space-time, is zero. In other words, we have ordinary Euclidean spaces. Of course, I can only draw two dimensions when they're really, you've got to think of this as three-dimensional, but don't worry too much about that. Here we have the positive curvature cases, where these, well, it just looked like a circle around there, but it's, you must think of this as really a three-dimensional version of that, which is a three-dimensional sphere, which starts that the Big Bang at zero size expands up to a maximum and then contracts down until we have at the end what's called the Big Crunch that everything has come back together again. The third example, this is the negative curvature case and I want to say a little bit more about that. This is what's called hyperbolic geometry. Like this one, the universe starts from the singular state where everything is all scrunched up together, expands outwards indefinitely. The difference here is that this one just sort of hangs on, never quite collapses. This one expands with a sort of definite speed and it just keeps on going. But let me say something about this hyperbolic geometry, which is the spatial geometry there. And what I'm going to show you is something, well this is, I ought to have had an Escher picture here to show you, but I somehow I have lost my picture. This will do instead. It's a, a very close to an Escher picture. Escher had things very much like this. These are slight mathematical variants on what Escher produced. Anyway, the point about this geometry 
as you can see, well, a lot of fish, black fish and white fish, and they seem to get smaller as you get over to the edge, but you have to think that these ones near the edge are really just the same size as the ones in the middle. I've depicted them here in such a way that I've had to squash down the ones at the outside in order to fit them into the picture. But this is a very accurate representation of hyperbolic geometry. It's geometry in which you can have parallel, lots of parallels to one line. You have to think of these as straight lines, these circular arcs which meet the boundary at right angles. And that one never meets this one because this at the boundary here, that's infinity, you see. So you have to think that if you were that little fish down there, you'd really be, you'd think you were just the same as this one thinks it is. They're all the same. And any, this representation is what's called a conformal representation. So if you look at very small shapes, you find they are accurately represented in this picture. You had to squash them down in scale to get them in the picture, but they're all supposed to be, another way of putting it is the angles are correctly represented. But the thing I want to emphasize about this picture is that this circle around the outside, of course it should really be three-dimensional and you'd have a sphere around the outside, but let's think about the circle around the outside. That represents infinity for the geometry which is inhabited by these fish. So if they were swimming away, it would take them an infinite time to get up to what looks like this boundary here. The thing about this picture then that I'm emphasizing is that you can represent infinity for the whole universe, this is this whole hyperbolic universe, at a perfectly good finite place. Um, and as far as the, what's called the conformal geometry, that is the geometry in which angles are correctly represented, distances get squashed down, but the conformal geometry is represented accurately in this picture. So bear that in mind. I want to say something about that later on. But for the moment, that's just a nice way of representing the geometry that is in this picture here. Okay, so those are the three original standard models. In these particular models, there's a thing here called lambda. That's a capital lambda, that thing. Lambda is zero. What is lambda? Well, lambda is what's called the cosmological constant. It's something that was introduced by Einstein in 1917 for the wrong reason. He wanted a universe that was static for various reasons, but it turned out that was wrong, and he needed to put this thing not equal to zero, it was a, had a positive value, in order to have a universe that could be the same for all time. But then it was discovered the universe expanded, and uh, he, or at least is said to have considered that this was his greatest mistake, because he otherwise might have predicted that the universe was expanding. <clears throat> anyway, that is a thing that could be there, and I'll say, a good deal about that later on. For the moment, I'd like you to look at this model here, the one with the positive curvature, and it starts from the Big Bang and goes on to a big crunch. Now, I have over here a number of suggestions for what might have happened before the Big Bang. Now, these are very various crazy ideas, and I should say, even though they're crazy, all the people who have put them forward are very respectable scientists, cosmologists, and uh, you need something a bit crazy. I'll say something about why that is the case. Uh, now, <clears throat> this curve here is what's called a cycloid. You can actually draw it by rolling a circle. You mark a point on the circumference of the circle and roll the circle along this line, and it describes that curve. This curve, this, in this picture, time is going that way. This curve represents the radius of the universe. So it's the size, if you like, of the, of the whole universe in this picture. And you see, in this picture, it started with the Big Bang. It ends at the Big Crunch. But according to this curve, it just keeps on going. So it was suggested, in fact, when this model was first put forward, it was very often called the cyclic model of the universe and it comes and it produces this singular state here where all matter is condensed into a single point uh, and somehow you have to imagine that it just bounces back out again and so it keeps on doing that. It can't do that with the ordinary laws of physics. It just goes singular here, but you sort of picture that maybe 
There's some way of getting around, some new law comes in, or perhaps it gets very complicated and swishes around and comes out again, or something like that. So various people have suggested models of that kind. In particular, the cosmologist Tolman suggested that uh, these cycles might change and get bigger, I think it was, as time progresses. That was supposed to express something about the second law of thermodynamics. Now, I'm going to have to say something about that. Uh, but just sort of bear in mind, I think I'll just throw this picture at you for the moment. You can see various ideas. Here we have <coughs> the Wheeler idea, which is that somehow it's like this, but then all the constants of nature get churned up again each time. And he wants to have them have different values at different phases of the cycle. Lee Smolin has an idea where black holes form and new uh, universes are born out of the black holes. And there's an idea due to Turok and Steinhardt and various other people in which uh, you have some collision between things called D-brains. I'll have to say a little bit about things like this later on. But they're all various crazy models about the Big Bang where you might not have you might not say that's the beginning of the universe, there was something going on before it. Okay. Now, we now know that these models are not really that good a representation of what's going on because this thing that Einstein introduced and then retracted, this cosmological constant, seems not actually to be zero. It has a positive value. It's one of these things that greatly puzzles me uh, because people, cosmologists for a long time were trying to find out what the value, I think I'll put this one over here because it's, oops, fits better, what the value of this cosmological constant was. And I remember going to conferences when people said, well, maybe at the next meeting we'll know what the value of the cosmological constant is. Uh, well, eventually it's found out what it is and it's not zero. And as soon as it's found, people started calling it not the cosmological constant anymore, they call it the mysterious dark energy. And that's what it's now called. Well, it's called dark energy, but it's usually called the mysterious dark energy. Um, I suppose this is because they didn't expect it. I may say I didn't expect it either, but uh, I was quite prepared for it to be there. I'd written papers in which it was allowed to be there. So the fact that it's discovered seems just a fact. And I don't quite see why one's so puzzled about it. I think people are puzzled because they expected it not to have, well, if it was going to have such a small value as it had to have, then it ought to be zero. That's not a very good argument, really. <laughs> but <laughs> it seems to have been the argument that people have used. Now I want to stress a point, which is one of the main points that I want to make in this talk, which has to do with the question, OK, not why we believe there's a cosmological constant, that comes from various different observations, but why we believe that there was a Big Bang at all. And one of the most impressive, there are a lot of different pieces of evidence which go together to make us have this expectation, but um, <clears throat> one of the most convincing arguments comes from the microwave background. This is radiation which is coming to us from, well, some people call it the the flash of the Big Bang, which you can actually see in a sense. You can't quite see it because it's radiation which is very low frequency, corresponding to a temperature which is about 3 degrees or 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. That's um, very cold. But what is rather striking about it is that it has a very, very well-defined temperature. Here we have a, a curve which is called a Planck curve or black body curve and going up this way we have the intensity at various frequencies the frequency is plotted this way and what one finds well there's a, a curve which was uh, predicted or explained by Max Planck it started off quantum theory in 1900 and this curve he had a very exact formula for it and this curve represents thermal equilibrium so if you have some radiation and matter and stuff all mixed up together in thermal equilibrium, and I'll say a little bit more about that, then it, the frequency, uh, the intensity at any given frequency follows a curve like this. Depending on the temperature, this curve may be moved over or one way or the other, but the shape of it is always exactly this shape. And what you find, 
These little boxes represent the limits of observation. And I should say, this transparency is an old one. If I had shown you a new transparency, you would have seen these little boxes as much smaller than this. Well, they start to get a bit bigger down here, but then if you look carefully at, at what it says about it, it's magnified by a factor of about 500. So in fact, although the boxes here give you the error, and round about here they're about the same size as these boxes, they're too big by a factor of about 500. So that means they're so tight, these measurements are so tight on the curve that you just wouldn't see there any off at all. It's an incredibly precise observation. You find that this theoretical curve fits the data to an enormous precision. And what does this tell us? This tells us that to an incredible precision, the early universe was in thermal equilibrium. Now that is a paradox in a certain sense. It's a very good indication that the early universe was sort of hot, just great big hot mess. And that is, if you like, uh, a very strong piece of evidence for the Big Bang. I should explain this picture over here. These are where we actually allow a positive cosmological constant. And what you see is that rather than having things recollapsing, they all do more or less the same thing. All these models start off up to about there. They look very much like the ones we had before, but then they start to accelerate away and there's this exponential increase. So they start accelerating, moving away faster and faster and faster. And it doesn't make much difference what the spatial curvature is. The universe has this acceleration, accelerating expansion. And this is due to the presence of this cosmological constant or the mysterious dark energy, whichever term you prefer. Now, why is it a paradox that this curve should be telling us that the early universe was in thermal equilibrium? Well, let me say something about the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is a crucial feature of what I want to say, and it's illustrated by this cartoon at the top here, which, well, okay, we have three pictures and you have to put them in the right order. Here we have a glass sitting on the edge of a table, a glass of wine. Here we have it falling through the air. Here we have it and the wine splashing out and here we have it smashed on the carpet at the bottom. And the correct order is this one, two, three. No, that's the way I've got them, you see. Time going that way. Let me co cover this up for the moment. Now, you see, according to the Newtonian dynamics that is quite sufficient for the description of this, what's going on here, the Newtonian laws are completely reversible in time. So that means it would equally be possible, according to Newtonian dynamics, for this to be first, then that, then that. There's nothing to choose between the two except that we never see this. We never see broken glasses with wine all spilt into the carpet, suddenly jumping up in the air and the wine going into the glass and then landing itself delicately on the edge of the table. That just doesn't happen. So the way we describe what, in addition to the Newtonian dynamics, is going on here, we say that there's a thing called entropy and this entropy has to increase in time, or certainly not decrease in time. And in these pictures, that's exactly what's happening. What is entropy? Well, roughly speaking, entropy is a measure of disorder. So it's telling you the disorder is increasing as time goes on. It's a sort of depressing law, if you like. It's telling you things are getting worse and worse. Well, I'll say a little bit more about that. It's not quite as bad as you might think. Uh, but at first, that's what it's telling us. And we can actually make this a bit more precise, because entropy, if I say disorder, that's not much use to you. I mean, how do you measure that? Well, there's a very wonderful formula due to the mathematical physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, Austrian physicist. And here's the formula. S is the entropy. I'm not quite sure why S is the entropy, but it is. Uh, and S is K times the logarithm of V. Well, you have to know what V is. What is V? Well, to explain that, I need to describe what's called phase space. Here we have a picture of phase space. What is phase space? Well, to describe phase space, let me start by describing something a little easier, namely configuration space. 
So you have to imagine some system consisting of lots and lots of bits. And here I've got lots and lots of bits. And for every location of the bits, and that can mean where the bits are, what, where the center of mass is, if you like, and where, how it's oriented, and so on. So all the parameters which are needed to describe where the bits are give you lots and lots of numbers you'd need in order to specify that. And what you do is you use those numbers as coordinates in some space. That's called configuration space. So that means each point in this space, it has a huge number of dimensions, each point here represents exactly one location of all these bits. So as these things move around, this point will move around in here. Now, phase space is just a bit more than that. Phase space, uh, for phase space we need to know not just where the bits are, but how the bits are moving. So we need to know the velocities, if you like, of the bits. Strictly speaking, it's the momenta. That's just the velocities times the mass, really. Uh, don't worry too much about that distinction. Um, so I put little arrows here to tell you where they're moving. And the dimension of this space is now twice as... I haven't changed the picture, but then it's hardly adequate anyway. But the number of dimensions has just gone up by a factor of two. So if it was a zillion before, it's now two zillion. Um, so this is now phase space. I've crossed off the configuration. And don't worry about all this. This is just some nice mathematics, which I'm not going to worry about. The point that I do want to stress is that now, if you know any one point there, the dynamics is completely fixes the system. So that there's a curve which goes through that line. The whole thing has got curves drawn on it. And that tells you how the evolution progresses. Once you know where that is, the dynamics is determined, it tells you where that point moves. So that's, that's all I'm going to use here. And that's what we've got here. This is phase space of this, let's imagine there's a box in which all that's sitting. And the location of all the particles in the situation is encompassed in this phase space here and the, also the motions of all the particles. Now what are these bubbles here that I've drawn? Those are what are called um, coarse graining boxes, coarse graining regions. What does that mean? That means if I take two points in the same bubble, I can't tell them apart as far as macroscopic coordinates are concerned. You see there are lots of air molecules and wine molecules, whatever they are, running around in here. And I may, may not care exactly where all those molecules are. I might care, on the other hand, what the pressure is, what the temperature is, various overall parameters, but I don't care about the exact fine detail of where all the little particles are. So I lump together in one of these boxes, one of these bubbles, all the different configurations which look just the same. So these, everything in there, would be pretty well indistinguishable from the point of view of macroscopic measurements. It's a little bit vague, but Entropy is a little bit vague. Uh, that'll do. Uh, and what you do then is you say, what if the particle was here, what is the volume of that bubble? Well, that's V. And then you're supposed to take the logarithm of that, and then you put this number here. That's called Boltzmann's constant. In fact, the only thing in this formula that was not due to Boltzmann is the K, which is Boltzmann's constant. But everything else <laughs> was Boltzmann's. So, I don't think he was interested in you know, how big things actually were. He was interested in the, in the general principles. OK, so this is a coarse-grained phase space now. And we have now the measure of entropy, because that's the, si the logarithm, basically, of the size of this bubble. Now, why does entropy increase with time? Well, you see, one thing I should explain is that these volumes tend to be absolutely stupendously different from each other. So if you happen to be in this one here, and that's the next one, this one would be so much bigger than that, that if you find your way into this, there's no chance of you finding that one back again. Well, when I say no chance, I mean an absolutely teeny-weeny chance. Um, so if you happen to be in one of these little bubbles at one time, and you wander around, then you find yourself in a bigger one, there's no chance of finding the little one again. So this tells you that wherever you're you are in this picture, the entropy has some value, the entropy is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, you say, that's all there is to the second law. It's pretty, pretty simple, isn't it? The only trouble is, let me ask a slightly different question. 
How is it that the glass got there on the edge of the table? Well, you might use the same argument, but this time you're using it backwards in time. And you find that the most likely way that this glass to have got on the corner of the table there is that it started a great mess on the ground there. The wine all sort of went, the grass assembled itself, the wine jumped into it, jumped on the edge. That's the right answer. If, that's the right answer, if all you know is the argument I just gave you before. So if you use the Boltzmann argument, instead of into the future, which is the user way, but if you use it in the past, you get that the entropy went up in the past too. Of course it didn't. That isn't how the glass got there. It's because somebody put it there. And in fact, that started from something with an actual lower entropy like this. So the way the actual universe behaves is indeed in accordance with the second law. But you can't argue in the past direction like this to get the right answer. Instead, there seems to have been something pulling it down in the past. Well, let's go and work our way backwards in time and see what happens. There we have our curve, and you go back, and there is the Big Bang. You go on right back and back and back until you get to the Big Bang. So to ensure that the entropy continues to go down in the past, we need an enormous constraint on the space-time, well, why space-time geometry? You see, I said there was a paradox here. I said there was something strange about this incredible curve here. What is strange is that this tells us that the early universe was in thermal equilibrium. Well, where is thermal equilibrium in this picture? Remember this picture? I didn't actually... I had it the right way around, too, before, which is that way. The biggest box of all, and in fact, this box is likely to be even bigger than all the rest put together, the biggest box of all is what's called thermal equilibrium. That's the maximum entropy. Maximum entropy. So we go back to the Big Bang. We find we're at thermal equilibrium. If this is maximum entropy because it's thermal equilibrium, why on earth is it the smallest value? So there's a paradox. How is it that the universe started off at maximum entropy and has been going up ever since? That's, I'm glad to hear you <laughs> see that's a little strange. Well, you see the answer to it. Lots of people pre presented wrong answers to this question for a long time. The correct answer, I won't worry you with the wrong answers, the correct answer is that as far as matter is concerned, indeed it is true that it was in thermal equilibrium. That, that tells us, this wonderful curve tells us, yes indeed, the matter was in thermal equilibrium. But the matter is not the whole story. The whole story involves the space-time geometry of the universe. And the space-time geometry involves gravity, according to Einstein's general theory of relativity. What about gravity? Why is that something a bit different? Well, I'll also show you another picture here. This is the sort of, the one at the top is the sort of thing that people often use as an example of how entropy might look increasing. Here we have a gas in a box, and we might have a little uh, smaller box where we have the gas to start with, and then we open the door there, and the gas starts spreading out through the whole region, and this represents an increase in entropy. So this is high entropy, middle of size entropy, pretty low entropy. Now let's suppose this is not just a gas in a box, but a lot of gravitating bodies. So these are, if you like, are stars or something like that, all running around, and they're attracting each other gravitationally. What you find is that they start clumping together like this, and eventually clump into black holes. I'll have to say a bit more about black holes later on. Uh, but, well, yes, I'll say a bit more about them later on. But what I want to emphasize here is that in both sets of pictures, entropy is increasing this way. It's just they look different. In the case of just the gas, the thing gets more and more uniform. When there's gravity involved, it starts off uniform and it gets less and less uniform. What we find in the actual universe is this and this. We find a great uniformity in the universe. As far as the matter is concerned, indeed, we find maximum entropy. That curve tells us this. As far as gravity is concerned, it's low entropy. 
Now, you see, as I think I said before, it's a pretty, if you like, boring law, the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us things are getting more and more boring. Well, that's only true, if you like, if you just have this picture. But in this picture, it's the other way around. And in fact, with the actual universe, it's a mixture of these, and so you, well, it doesn't tell you. It could be interesting, it could be boring, it could be all sorts of things. So we have progression in both directions here. I mean, in, in this direction, in both cases, but here it represents a things getting more uniform and here less uniform. So what we find in the universe is it's this and this. As far as gravity is concerned, it's very low entropy. In fact, I can give you an illustration of how important this is to us. It's the very thing we rely on. Um, let me talk about the sun. The sun is a hot spot in the otherwise dark sky. And you see, people often say, well, we get energy from the sun, but that's not quite right. What we get from the sun is not energy because the earth receives from the sun just about as much as it spews out again. Okay, at night, if you like, we have this radiation going back out again. If the earth simply got energy from the sun, it would just get hotter and hotter and hotter. But in fact, we get just about the same amount of energy from the sun as we, we give back again. Well, with global warming, it's actually, we maybe we're actually uh, giving a bit more away, but let's not talk about that here. Uh, the, this picture is a pretty good approximation. And you see, I've got somebody here having a good meal, and you see what's really, you see the plants here are taking advantage of a certain fact. You see, the sun is hotter than the background. What does that mean? That means that the photons from the sun are individually more energetic. They ha have a higher frequency, and according to Planck's famous formula, E equals H nu, that means the energy is proportion to, proportional to the frequency. Uh, here we have a higher frequency than there. That means the energy per photon is higher for those which come from the sun than for those which go away again. So you get a few, relatively few photons coming from the sun, and the energy being carried away with loads and loads and loads of photons. Now, loads and loads and loads of photons have many more degrees of freedom than these. More degrees of freedom means larger phase space volume, means higher entropy. So the entropy is high there and low here. So really what the sun is giving us is a source of low entropy. The plants, the clever plants with their photosynthesis, are able to convert the photons into lower frequency photons and thereby build up their substance. Animals eat plants and they uh, live on, on the sort of reservoir of low entropy. We eat either plants or animals and uh, we take advantage again, ultimately, of the plants uh, in their cleverness in reducing the, uh, well, reducing the frequency of the photons from high to low and thereby reducing the entropy. Okay, well, it's a complicated story in detail, but the key point is that the sun is a hot spot in a dark sky. Well, what is the key point there? What is, why is the sun a hot spot in the dark sky? Why is the sun there at all? Well, it's there. Okay, there are all sorts of things like thermonuclear reactions and so on taking place, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the sun is there, and it's there because it's held together by gravity. And the gravity is the key thing. Previously, the sun was just a lot of gas, and this condensed by gravity and produced a hot thing. And it's this hot spot in a dark sky which we take advantage of. Okay. So that is, you see, it's gravity is the key thing. And it's the fact that we have gravity clumping, in this case, just to get stars. And that's uh, what we live off. Well, what about black holes? That's the ultimate, if you like, in what stars do. I have a nice picture of a black hole. It doesn't help us too much for what I want to say. I just thought I'd show it to you. Uh, now, the key point really is that inside there, you can't see it, inside there is a singularity. And it's a bit like the Big Bang in that respect. The Big Bang was a nasty old singularity. And we have at the, um, in this cores of black holes, also a singularity. Now I've got to find the right transparency here. It's one we had before. What I want to do now is improve upon this picture. Okay, you, I could improve the artistry, but that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm going to improve it because 
This is an, a, a uniform model where the material is completely uh, isotropic and homogeneous. There's no irregularity in the matter content of the universe. That's the sort of models that you can actually solve the equations for, and so that's what people did. But we know that the universe isn't completely uniform, otherwise there'd be nothing interesting going on in it. And uh, if we introduce irregularities, the pictures have to be changed somewhat. These red lines, which I've now introduced, are basically the black hole singularities. So you don't just have the singular state at the beginning where curvatures of space-time diverge to infinity. We've now got singular states at the end representing the singularities of black holes. I'll draw you some other pictures of black holes which are a little bit more to the point of what I want to say. Uh, but these ones have black holes. It's even worse for the big crunch of the model here because it's a horrendous mess of all these black hole singularities coming together. And that's a more accurate picture, if you like, than the one that we had before. Now, we also might have the cosmological constant and put the, put the uh, singularities on that one if I haven't gone and lost them. It looks just the same as the other one, except we don't have a big crunch. Uh, where has it gone? Here we are. So I put the black hole singularities on. Okay, there we are. Now I have to say a bit more about Einstein's general theory of relativity. The basic ingredient, the first ingredient of Einstein's theory is the principle of equivalence, the Galilei-Einstein principle of equivalence, which roughly speaking is just telling you that, well here's old Galileo, whether or not he actually did this, uh, we can imagine he did, dropping a big rock and a little rock from the top of the Leaning Tower, and as we all now know, they would fall together like this. At least they would if there were no air resistance. Now suppose you imagine that you're an insect sitting on the big rock, say, having a look at the little one. Because they fall together, it would look as though the little one hovers before the insect, and there doesn't seem to be any gravity as far as the insect is concerned as the dropping takes place. Of course, something will happen at the end, but astronauts know how to do it better by being in orbit, but it's the same thing. Here is an astronaut, and there is some futuristic space station like Stanley Kubrick's thing, and the astronaut is looking at the space station, and it seems to hover in front of him. It's just like the rock in front of the insect. So somehow, despite the fact that the Earth is right there, and you can see it there, uh, gravity seems to have been cancelled out simply by falling freely. That's the principle of equivalence. Well, there's a bit more to it than just that, because you might think if it was just that, why is there any effect of gravity at all? You could just get rid of it by falling freely. Well, you can't quite do that. And here I've shown why. Because the Earth isn't really quite at infinity. Here we have an astronaut. And let's imagine that astronaut is surrounded by a sphere of particles. Now, the astronaut is accelerating to the Earth's center. I mean, it could be in orbit, but so but accelerating to the Earth's center at a certain rate. Particles a little bit closer to the Earth's center will accelerate a bit more. So relative to the astronaut, there will be a little bit of acceleration away from the astronaut. Here, the acceleration is a little less. So relative to the astronaut, it will be away from the astronaut. Whereas at the sides, you see the acceleration is slightly inwards because the Earth's center is not at its infinity. And so, relative to the astronaut, there will be slight inward acceleration. So this ellipsoid, sorry, this sphere we started with, starts at rest relative to the astronaut, and in a moment, it will be stretched into this ellipsoid. Now this is what in general relativity we refer to, the, well, it's the tidal effect. Uh, it's called the vial part of the curvature. I'll have to say a bit more about that. If there was, this, is, this occurs when there's no matter inside here, and you, what you actually find, it's an expression of the inverse square law, is that the sphere and the ellipse which it gets distorted into actually have the same volume. That's an expression of the inverse square law. But if there's matter inside, then the volume gets reduced. And these are two parts of the curvature, according to Einstein's theory, the vile and the Ritchie part of the curvature. I've drawn this in space-time, terms, these represent the world lines of these particles, so the distortion of this sphere into an ellipsoid 
is represented here. We have a sphere as time progresses, becomes more stretched out. This case, where it's accelerating into the Earth, the volume gets reduced. Okay, these, these are pictures. Take a little while to get used to those things, but uh, really what I wanted to show you is that it's called space-time curvature. Why is it called space-time curvature? Well, you see, it's very like this. Here we have surfaces. This one is a positively curved surface. This is a negatively curved surface. It looks like a saddle, you see. The positively curved surface, if you start as straight lines as you can draw, they're called geodesics, they, even if they're parallel to begin with, that corresponds, you see, to these lines here being parallel to begin with, that is at rest to begin with here, they start to come together. That's just what's happening here. Whereas in the negative curve, they spew apart. And that's what's happening to these other ones here. Okay, it's complicated. In, in, all the dimension, in, in four space-time dimensions, which is what you've got in general theory of relativity, these curvature things have got lots and lots of components. And I'm not going to worry about all that. I'm just going to give you the general idea here. But what you find is that the whole curvature, which is measured in this kind of way, is split into these two parts. This is the empty space part. And that's the part where there's matter around. I'm sorry this is a little bit, uh, takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, but it just illustrates how the curvature splits into these two pieces. In fact, if you want to be a little bit more accurate, you can do it with light rays. And in fact, it's quite nice. You can, here I've just drawn the analog of the pictures at the bottom over there with light rays. And this is the bending of light. And this is uh, what's called the lensing effect. Here we imagine the sun. You see, imagine you could see through it. And uh, the star field gets distorted. Circular patterns get stretched into ellipses outside here. And that's the vile part. In the middle, you've got the Ritchie part. And Einstein's theory tells you it's the Ritchie part, which you equate to the density of matter. The vile part measures gravity. It measures free gravity. These things you can actually see. It's very remarkable. There are many, many observations now where you can see effects like the ones in this picture here, just by looking at distant galaxies. And you see they get stretched out. This is because in the middle there's, there's some lensing object, like the sun in this picture here, which has stretched out the, the uh, images all around. And, and if you look at this, sort of squint a bit perhaps, you can see it's as though there's some lens in the middle there having this effect. And this is now a very often used uh, aspect of uh, ob uh, observational cosmology. You can sort of tell how much mass there is in the middle by looking at the distortion outside. Very striking. Now, OK, I'm just telling you all that, really, because I wanted to give some idea of these two parts of curvature. The Ritchie part, which is what Einstein says that is, is due to, directly due to matter, and the vile part, which is free gravity. Now, I have to tell you that, because otherwise I can't explain the idea I'm trying to give you here. But, OK, let's start our cosmological models now. Well, I should have had my uh, black holes on them, I suppose. So let's bring the black holes back. Here they are. Now you see in this picture, you've got singularity, singularities at the beginning and singularities in the black holes, which are sort of the ends as far as anybody who falls into one is concerned. Now, What's special about the Big Bang one? Yes, I said that what is special about the Big Bang, which is explaining why the entropy can be low, despite the fact that it seems to be thermal equilibrium as far as matter is concerned, what is special is that the vile curvature seems to be zero, or very, very small. And that's very special. So let me draw that here. The Big Bang singularity was enormously constrained and you can even give a measure of this, to one part in much greater than something like 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123. Let me give you some feeling for how precise that is. How big is that number? Well, you see, suppose I wanted to write it down, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, with 10 to the 123 zeros. Well, I wouldn't be able to write that down even if I put one zero in every proton in the observable universe. There's not nearly enough room to write it down. Of course, I've written it down here. But then, 
And then I cheated by using double exponents. But of course, that's mathematics. That's not cheating. You have to... You know, mathematics isn't cheating. <laughs> okay. What is... I'm going to call the vial curvature hypothesis. This is just a hypothesis. I'm saying this seems to be true of the universe as we know it. That there are these singularities in the universe, as I've indicated here. Some of them in the future, the black hole ones. Some of them in the past, well, the Big Bang. But the Big Bang seems to have been enormously constrained in this sort of way, that the vial curvature was pretty well zero. Now, I'm not saying why that was true. Well, I'm going to try and say why that might have been true. That's the crazy idea I want to give you. I have to get there first. Uh, let me first just, I'll just flash this one up. You see, people tend to think, well, the theory we need to explain singularity structure is quantum gravity. The only trouble is we don't have a quantum gravity theory. The trouble with quantum gravity is that the, all the quantum gravity theories we know at the moment are time symmetrical, and that doesn't explain the difference between the singularities at the past and the future. Why is the past one, the past one so special to be constrained in this enormous way? Now, I've lost my universe I've just got the singularities. Well, that's good, and that's really what we're talking about, isn't it? Um, why is it that the initial ones are so constrained and the final ones don't seem to be. It tells us that whatever theory we should have is asymmetrical in time, but we don't have the theory. Well, I've got to say even a little bit more about general relativity. I'm sorry about that, but I really should, which is the light cones. Light cones are an important part of relativity theory. This is time going up the picture here, and this describes a, a theoretical flash of light. You imagine in the center here, there's a flash of light, and I've written a space picture here. There it is, and then it starts spreading out like this. Concentric spheres around this point. You have the past cone, which is concentric spheres converging on that point. So that's the light cone, and it's the most important. We don't need the bottom thing here. It's the most important aspect of relativity, really, because it tells you how causal effects can propagate. Light signals go like this. Particles with mass go within the cone. They're restricted by the speed of light. Special relativity, that's Minkowski spaces, it's called. Looks like this. That is to say, the light cones are all arranged nicely, uniformly. Einstein's general relativity, they're all, all over the place, what they could be. That's the difference. Uh, now, you see, Einstein's general relativity allows us to do all sorts of things like draw pictures of black holes. And here we do have the collapse to a black hole with the light cones behaving in this rather odd way, which is what prevents signals from escaping outside. This is the horizon here. There's time going up the picture, collapsing material here. There's the singularity in the middle. And if you're unfortunate enough to fall in, there's no way you can get back out again because the light codes are tipping over like this. And they're forcing you into this terrible place in the middle where curvatures go to infinity and so on. OK, that's what the light cones are good for. I want to tell you something else about the light cones. I think I'll tell you on this one here. Remember the picture I showed you about the hyperbolic geometry, which was a conformal picture. And that conformal picture, um, there was a scale involved which could um, be greater or smaller, but I didn't want to change the angles. Small shapes were accurately represented in the, in the pictures which you had before. Uh, just trying to find that one again. No, it doesn't matter. Now, in the kind of geometry that you have in relativity, you have the light cones. Those are the crucial things. Perhaps I should put a light cone back for you. The light cones are the crucial things. But the light cones are most of the geometry. In a certain sense, they're nine-tenths of the geometry. You see, the metric, according to relativity, has ten components. But nine of them tell you where the light cone is. The other one tells you the scale. So here I have a light cone drawn, and I have certain surfaces here which represent the ticking of a clock, if you like. Suppose we have a clock. That world line is a clock, and these represent successive ticks that that clock makes. And you see that these surfaces here they're actually defined by the light cone. The only thing that's not defined is the scale. So the metric has 10 components, um, and it measures time. I don't worry too much about these pictures. You could, if you have a clock going along, you see, it's the metric. The clock has a world line. That's this curve. And the 
time that this clock measures is the interval according to it's this formula here. Don't worry too much about the formula, but it's the metric of space-time which determines the clock rates. And the light cone is most of that information, but not quite all of it. The scaling is the remainder of that information. Now, I want to describe to you two mathematical tricks which we've been using in the subject of relativity for a long time. These mathematical tricks well, it's one of them is sort of the opposite of the other one. And uh, the first one, in a finite place. This trick can be used in relativity theory. It's been used for a long time to describe infinity for gravitational radiation. You see, what does this picture mean? Here I have two bodies going around each other, and as they go around each other, they spew out these gravitational waves. Those are ripples in space-time which go out, and you want to know how, what happens to them out at infinity, and there's a trick here where you make infinity, you squash it down until it looks like a finite region. So there's the trick. You shrink infinity down to a finite place by taking this omega. Well, this omega thing is a scale factor, so you let it go to zero. That's the idea. Now, the opposite trick is you can take a cosmological singularity, like the ones I've just been talking about, and you stretch it out. So here I've squashed down to make infinity finite. Here I stretch out to make a singularity into a nice smooth place. It's the same, or more, almost the same trick, but it's just the other way around. You see, it's, a, it's, a, it's the inverse of the trick. My colleague Paul Todd has used this as a formulation of the vial curvature hypothesis. It's a very nice way of doing it. What does he mean? You see, instead of saying the vial curvature goes to zero, okay, you can say that, but what he says, another way of saying it, which is much nicer, you say, that the Big Bang is such that, as far as its conformal geometry is concerned, infinity is just a nice, smooth place. Okay, to get the singularity, just squash it down. As I say, most of the information is in the light cones. The light cones are all nice and regular here, but you squash them down and you get the singularity of the Big Bang. So Todd's form of the vial curvature hypothesis is that this trick works. The trick works in the past, that is to say, you can find a nice smooth surface to represent the Big Bang. The future trick, well, when there is a cosmological constant, you see, I told you that lots of people didn't like it or didn't expect it. I didn't like it for a while, but I've come to love it now. You see, this is the thing, you have to change your attitude and, and find out what's true and then you learn to like it. So I found that actually the cosmological constant is a good thing. And it makes this trick work, in some respects, much better than if it wasn't there. In fact, in one crucial respect, it makes something work which would never work otherwise. I think I'm going to do quick... I probably shouldn't waste time doing all these things, but let me show you something which is, helps me describe the things I want to describe um, a little more precisely than otherwise. This is just what's called a strict conformal diagram. Conformal diagram is a nice way of representing a whole universe in a, in, on the back of an envelope. So you have certain conventions. This brown dotted line means a symmetry axis. A purple straight line represents infinity. The squiggly line represents singularity. A point represents a point. A little circle represents a sphere. Those, that's the key. And what you've got to do is you draw some diagram like this picture here. Okay, there's infinity, there's infinity, there's an axis. Each point in the diagram, you've got to imagine rotating around the axis, so it rotates around. The only slight catch is that here, your, your imagination will probably take this round in a circle here, but you've got to take it round in the whole two-dimensional sphere. Okay, that's just a piece of mathematics. Um, but if you can do that, you can represent all these cosmologies which I've been flashing up at you in these nice little pictures here. You can represent a black hole, which uh, is this picture here. There's the black hole. You can even represent what Stephen Hawking tells us to expect of a black hole if you wait an awful long time. Here is a collapse to a black hole. There's its horizon. You wait and 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 you wait. And you wait until, we well, see Hawking tells us, that a black hole has a temperature. It's not completely black, it's not completely cold. It has a very, very tiny temperature. The tiny temperature is so tiny 
that for the hottest black holes we have any reason to believe in in the universe, that temperature is sort of comparable with the coldest temperatures that's ever made, been made on the Earth. So, pretty cold. But the universe, as it keeps on expanding, is going to get colder and colder and colder and colder. And ultimately, particularly because of this accelerated expansion, ultimately it will get colder than the black hole. When it's colder than the black hole, the black hole will start to radiate away. It will lose some of its heat. And as it radiates away, it loses energy, and therefore it loses mass by E equals mc squared. E and energy and mass are equivalent. And therefore it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and finally disappears with a pop. Now why do I say pop and not bang? Well, because it's not very big by cosmological standards. It'd be a bit nasty, I mean very nasty I should say, if, if it went off in this hall here. But uh, that's pretty small beer when you consider cosmology and so on. So that's why it's pop. And here is a picture of the thing doing it. Well, don't worry too much about that, except you can draw pictures of it. That's nice. Uh, but what we do want to, what I do want to emphasize is that it seems to be what's going to happen. The universe, you see, this is the thing that, that worried me about all the universe that we seem to have to get used to, is it's a dreadfully boring place, it seems. You see, it just goes on, okay, you get these black holes, and they sit around, and they sit around, and sit around, and they wait for the universe to cool down, and then finally, well, they start to shrink. It takes an age, even longer and longer and longer, before they evaporate away, finally disappear, pop, okay. That's the end of the black holes. You've got bigger ones, they take longer, but they disappear eventually, pop. They go off at the end like that. Okay, that's what's happening. Nothing left but this radiation running around. It seems dreadfully boring. That's for eternity. But then you have to think, what's going to be around in the universe at that time? Not you or me. The only thing left in the universe, according to this picture, will be radiation. Ra massless radiation. Now what about, what's so funny about massless radiation? Well, photons, you like. A photon has the curious property <coughs> that the moment from it's created to when it's absorbed, it doesn't experience any time at all. It's, that's the way relativity works. There's no time between creation and destruction. So it just... Well, it's even more than that. If that photon is going sailing off into the universe, eternity to that photon... Well, it's no time at all. It's no big deal for a photon. In fact, if there's nothing left in the universe but massless entities, there is no way of keeping time. That's the point I want to make. You can't build a clock. And the reason you can't build a clock is that the equations that govern massless entities, photons or other things which might be around, now here's where the idea that I'm trying to describe needs certain things to be true that we don't know are true. What I want to claim is that ultimately everything that's around will decay away into massless particles. And this requires certain things that we don't know are true, that there should be what's called a massless fermion, that there's a massless charged particle, and so on. But if nothing is left but things which have no mass, then you find that the geometry they respect is the conformal geometry that I've been talking about. The scale is forgotten. Somehow the universe forgets how to keep time. You can't build a clock, there's no way it can keep time. And so the proposal that I'm making is that it's a bit like this here. Now, the pictures which I showed you for a moment of the various cosmological models, there's a point I want to make, and that is that when there's a cosmological constant which is zero, they look different in the future from the past. Well, this one does because they don't worry about that one, but these ones you have infinity, which is actually what's called null. It's like, it's it's tangent to the light cone. Whereas if there's a positive cosmological constant, these things are called space-like. So the light cones poke through them. Right? And they look just like the Big Bang, but the other way around. So I'm making the wild suggestion that in the remote future, the universe loses track of time and it's only interested in conformal geometry. Likewise, in the remote past, if you go right down to the Big Bang, what do you find? Well, you find energies get hotter and hotter and hotter, more and more and more. You get very energetic particles, and at that point, <coughs> the mass of these particles becomes irrelevant because the energy is so much greater than 
the mass of the particle, that they're more or less massless there too. So I'm saying in the future, there's nothing left but massless things. In the past, there's nothing left but massless things. And they don't know anything about the metric. All they know is conformal geometry. So the proposal is that you match them together. And here I've matched it with the conformal diagrams. And here I've just matched it. Well, it's a sort of conformal diagram. I require, you can either call these requirements, that's a sort of negative thing, or you can say predictions, that's positive, isn't it? You can say, our theory predicts so-and-so. Let's do it that way around then. It predicts the existence of a massless fermion, that means a massless particle like an electron. Uh, we don't know that there is, there could be neutrinos which are massless. We don't know if that's the case. All we know is that there are massive ones and there could be at most one massless one, but there might be a massless one. What's more a little alarming is we need a massless charged particle, like an electron, but with no mass. And the idea is that, well, this is a thing about quantum mechanics, which has to do with, well, let me show you a very rough sketch of what I perceive. This is meant to be the phase space now, you see. Remember the second, just, I should get this the right way up, which is that way up. Remember that the universe seems to have started out with this tiny region of phase space. That's because we have a vial curvature hypothesis. According to Todd, it's because you can extend through the Big Bang in a conformal way. And according to me now, I'm saying that glues onto a previous phase of the universe in which you had its maximum expansion. Ex expansion. And that really means that the whole phase space of the previous universe has to go into the little tiny region representing the Big Bang of the next one. So this is a pretty sketchy picture, but that's what I'm proposing here. That does need some rescaling, not only of the metric, but also of some of the rules of quantum mechanics, and that needs to be looked into quite seriously. But nevertheless, that's the picture that I'm proposing. Finally, 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 is this something we could make observational tests of? Well, I believe we could. And I just want to indicate the observational implications of this idea. And I think I put this one here. There are observational implications. And I want to indicate two of them. Let's suppose that the previous phase of the universe had a physics which is just the same as the one we have here. There is the possibility that somehow the constants of nature get recooked each time it goes through here. That's just not going to be bad news for me because uh, it's hard to make any predictions at all in that case. But uh, let's say that the constants of nature don't get changed. And here we have in the previous phase of the universe various black holes. There could be great big holes in the middles of galaxies which start to spiral into each other. They go around, and as they do this, they produce ripples in space-time, gravitational radiation. Now, what one finds in this scheme is that in order this matching to work, for the conformal geometry to match from one side to the other, these gravitational waves actually get through. So they get through to the next phase. That's one of the striking features about this scheme. They actually get through. And as they get through, they cause certain fluctuations in the density on the other side. So there will be density fluctuations, and these density fluctuations are the sorts of things that cause the slight variations in the temperature as you look around at in the microwave background in different directions. OK, it's a thermal radiation, but the temperature is not exactly the same in all different directions. And this is these satellites called WMAP, all sorts of other satellites, and Earth-based uh, observations and so on, have m been very interested in measuring these density fluctuations. And this model would produce some definite uh, scheme as to what these density fluctuations should be like. So we have two forms of observation, things like the W map and so on. And here I've put down LISA. This is a gravitational wave detection scheme which would consist of some satellites, uh, a little trailing the Earth in its orbit, forming this equilateral triangle, and you'd have to try and measure slight changes in the lengths of these paths, which would indicate the presence of gravitational radiation. And the idea is that LISA might be able to measure 
these primordial gravitational waves. The thing is that this scheme seems to make pretty clear predictions. I, I haven't gone into it thoroughly yet. I have a student looking at it, so I don't know fully what the conclusions are, but it seems that there should be some quite definite predictions from this model, and one would have to see whether these predictions are in agreement or not with observations. Lisa's not there yet, but when it's working, uh, it should be able to maybe give us some clues as to what's going on with regard to primordial gravitational radiation. Okay, I think I better stop at that point. Thank you very much. What do you think of the big crunch? I mean, do you think it would exist or would it actually happen after a long time? Every stable system, every unstable system has to come to a constant stable state, right? So I, I expect a brick crunch to happen probably at some point in time. Well, that's not the scheme I have. I mean, There's one more question, yes. if I could complete that also. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, you said um, the Big Bang is kind of the start of time. So what, what happened before start of time? Is there anything called before start of time in the first place? There has to be something, so something exists after that, right? Well, you see this in picture, that sense. it keeps on going, that's all, you see, it's, it's endless. I mean, you can map all this into a, some other picture too, which I could yes. have done for you, but uh, the, it just keeps on going. So there's no initial state. It's a bit like steady state model in that sense. Yes. There is no beginning, there is no crunch either. But, but what you have are infinitely dispersed expansion and that then becomes the next new Big Bang. And it just keeps on going like that. I, if you have an infinitely <laughs> expanding system, it has to, be, it has to come to a, a constant point so you have the next infinite thing coming up, right? Well, not in the scheme. You have to have a rescaling all the time. You see, the, uh, the metric gets rescaled and, and in a certain sense, Planck's constant gets rescaled each time. But but it, it, you need that, but it's so, not... Uh, so, at n one point, <laughs> at n equal to infinity, probably, yes. you'll have the rescaling constant being infinity again. So, it doesn't well, match could, up. You could talk about where the whole thing came from, if you like. Yeah. Yes, no, I, sure. In fact, there are pictures, which I don't know whether I, I brought or not, which maybe show you the sort of thing you're asking about. Here, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is a question that... Uh, has uh, concerned me for a while. That is the, and you, you touched on it a little bit when you said that uh, the uh, photon doesn't experience any time from yes, it. Yes. Okay. If that's so, does the photon know anything about space? Or would space also not be existent? Well, it doesn't photon? measure space, you see, because the space and time are, are related to each other via the light cone, but it does know the light cones. You see, what I was trying to say is that nine out of the ten components of the metric is actually where the light cones are. So although photons don't actually measure the scale, they know where the light cones are, because they, I mean, they're going along it. So the, uh, the light cones, which is nine-tenths of the metric, is determined by the photons. But not actually space or time, because the space and time, if you like, another way of putting it, is that if you know the speed of light and you know a second, then you know a light second and vice versa, so that, so that space measurements and time measurements are coupled once you've got the light cones, yeah, they're coupled to each other. So not knowing time implies not knowing space too, if you like. Yeah, yes. That's, thank you. Okay, over here. Yeah, in your, um, in your picture you've described these uh, rising of, gravi uh, of black hole singularities. Yes. Uh, but I have a problem with that when you have uh, the fact you have a gravitational time dilation from the standpoint of an external observer, uh, a black hole will never actually form in, in, in a finite well, time. Well, <laughs> for the space-time picture, it, has, it does. So, so uh, okay, there are ways of looking at it where you think it doesn't happen. But uh, if you're thinking of the whole space-time, then certainly the, it's there. So uh, I don't think that uh, gets you out of it, if you like. But I have to get rid of the black holes by Hawking evaporation. If the black holes were still there at the end, they would have a measure of, of time as well. I mean, they, they have mass, and so uh, uh, my proposal wouldn't work if they were still around. It's necessary to get rid of them, in this, which, which fortunately the Hawking evaporation does. Stephen Hawking saves us. No? There you go. 
Go ahead. Hi, I just want to thank you for coming first. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, you. you said that as the universe cools, a black hole will lose its mass because it's losing its yes. energy. Um, and eventually it will pop. When that happens, all that will be left are protons, and therefore time will stop. I understand that time I will stop. I said photons, actually. Photons, yeah. I understand that time will stop, but how does the matter actually get destroyed? I thought matter couldn't be created or destroyed. <laughs> I should say that there is actually a huge question mark related to what happens when the black hole disappears. And nobody knows. And there are various proposals. So I'm just taking the simplest one here. I'm taking the one that suits me, if you like, which is, which is, you know, it's also the one that's most favored, I think, by people, which is that the black hole does disappear, and it disappears in an explosion where that explosion takes the form of radiation, so that you have basically photons coming out. So now, there could be other particles as well. There could be massive particles like uh, electrons and so on, and then those have to decay on my scheme. And... Uh, we don't know that electrons do decay. We, we don't know that protons decay. Um, but all that would be required by my, my model. So this is, if you like, either a requirement or a prediction, depending on which way you want to read it. All right, well, thank you very much. OK, thank you. OK, over here. Go ahead. Well, the microscopic black holes at Planck length that are predicted to exist does your theory have an explanation for those? You're talking about what are called the virtual. You see, the, an actual, you have to be a little careful, because in quantum mechanics, one has these things called virtual processes. And I think you're referring to um, things that might be there in this, what's called the foam in the, in the, at the Planck scale. Yes. That really also depends on, on theory. One doesn't know whether they're there or not. But um, <coughs> it certainly a quite respected view that there could be black holes. But they just sort of come and go all the time. They, they, they're, they're evaporating as soon as they appear. So according to the Hawking evaporation scale, if you had a, a black hole of a mass, a Planck mass, it would disappear in a Planck time, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds, which isn't very long. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a, a tiny time. So. Yeah, they would appear and disappear in this scheme, but, but they would only be there kind of potentially all the time. They wouldn't make any difference to the, to the uh, scheme that I'm proposing. And what about Planck scale universes? Well, again, that, they would disappear also at the same time. But, but one doesn't know, you see. These things are... I'm not really saying much about quantum gravity. These, these ideas are things which people bring up when they talk about quantum gravity, and they're among the ideas which certainly you probably read about, and uh, we don't know whether they're true or not because we don't have a consistent theory of quantum gravity. It's certainly a possibility. But on the scheme that I'm presenting, uh, they're not really playing a role. I mean, okay, they could be there, they could, uh, if you look at a small enough scale, they could be there. But then something has to happen when you go from one side to the other because the scales, roughly speaking, change. And so Planck scale, in a certain sense, gets renormalized when you go across. See, Planck constant, Planck's constant gets renormalized and, and, the, and the metric gets renormalized. So I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> okay, something <over>. something <laughs> funny may happen there. Yeah. Thank you. But it does. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to talk to us. It was a fascinating lecture. Could you? I'm interested in your massless charged particle. Yes, Can I'm interested. In yeah. too. <laughs> yes. could, could you talk a little bit about its nature and where we might look for it and why we haven't seen it yet? Well, they would have to be um, very hard to make. Um, they're not part of present-day um, physical theory, certainly not part of the standard model. Um, and sometimes people object and they say, well, <clears throat> if you have a massless particle uh, which um, is charged, then it will produce a, a sheet of radiation and so on. These pictures uh, seem to apply very much when you have a sort of particle picture. With regard to the f a field picture, they make perfectly good sense. Now, they haven't been seen, absolutely. Um, and I don't think uh, there's any suggestion that dark matter is anything like that. But uh, I, I would just have to postulate that they're there on this scheme. Otherwise, <clears throat> actually there are other ways of getting rid of charge which I haven't gone into, which might not require the existence of a massless charged particle. And they might be more comfortable. I don't think particle physicists are very keen on the idea of <laughs> massless charged particles. Um, it just seems to me the most plausible way around the problem I otherwise have 
You see, if, if you have positive and negative charges and they annihilate, then you've just got radiation and that's fine. But if you get sort of trapped in an event horizon, a single charged particle, and there's no charge particle of the opposite charge to come around and, and, and uh, neutralize it, it's just, you're just left with it, which is a nuisance. Now, it may be that there are non-local quantum EPR effects or something which will do the trick for you. It needs thinking about seriously. But uh, I have no answer to this question. And my only, uh, the, the simplest thing to say at this stage is that there would be massless charged particles. It might not be the only answer. And it might be there are other ways of doing it which are not so unpleasant for particle physicists. Thank you. <laughs> oh, serious. I just want to be sure I understand your new idea yeah. correctly. Starting from where we are in the universe right now. Yeah. If you were to let time run out, everything eventually will become just light. And it'll be evenly distributed. And light itself has no sense of time and no sense of itself. So you've got what we would see as a very cool universe, but what the universe at that point would see as something that's neither hot or cold, it's just all the same stuff. So is there really a difference between what's really, really hot and what's really cold? Well, in this scheme, there has to be no difference in a sense. That, uh, that's right. Because uh, basically, um, the, this matter that's, that you end up with um, has no metric. It, doesn't, it has no way of, of measuring the metric. And it has, uh, I think, the idea of temperature. I haven't thought all these things through. But I think, clearly, if you're going to be able to match the Big Bang with the um, remote expanded universe, you've got a very low temperature on one side and a very high temperature on the other side. And so if they're to be matched, um, yes, you have to lose track of temperature as well. So that would indeed be part of this proposal. Yes, that's right. Well, for this to be true, yeah. you would then also have a universe of no size. With no size, yes. Well, there's no metric, you see. So there's yes. no scale. Yeah. So infinity and a singularity become the very same thing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what this proposal is. See, when I've drawn these pictures here, the, you may not see the distinction, but the purple line here represents eternity. eternity. That's infinity. And then that smoothly goes over to the Big Bang. See, what I'm saying is that the conformal geometry actually is perfectly makes sense here. It's just that in normal physics, you demand too much. You say, we need to know certain things. You need to know the scale. You need to know how to measure time. You need to know how to measure space. And if you forget that, but you keep the light cones, you keep those things which are conformally invariant, such as electromagnetic fields and uh, other massless entities, uh, and if you keep that, then you can match this perfectly well, provided the vile curvature hypothesis in Todd's form is true, because gravity has a particular way of scaling which makes it only work when that is true. So and it's the only proposal I know of which actually requires the vile curvature hypothesis. I think that does very well to bring the reality of imperfection back into the universe. <laughs> you know, there's some kind of, some kind of evolution, right? Well, it's, it starts all over again in this picture. I mean, you certainly have imperfections in the sense that you have these little ripples which get through here. So it's not exactly um, a uniform universe at any stage. But it enables you to compute what scale these ripples are going to be from the behavior of the universe in the previous size. So, I'm still trying to get my head around the idea that, there's no, yeah. that every place is a center and there's no edge. But that's pretty easy, I guess. I don't know. Go ahead. Yes, this is a naive question. Um, you said that the black hole has a singularity at the beginning and uh, light cannot escape. And yeah. uh, the universe also has a singularity at the beginning and light cannot escape either. So the question, my question is simple. Is our universe a black hole? And if no. not, why not? And if yes, in what? No, actually, some of the things are not quite what I was saying. The singularity in a black hole is in the future. You see, if you fall into a black hole, then you run into that singularity. So as far as local observers are concerned, the black hole singularities are future singularities. The Big Bang singularities are past singularities. You can see that in these conformal diagrams, but uh, probably to find one is going to be a challenge for me. No, here we are. 
Um, you see the black hole singularity is at the top here, which means it's a future singularity, whereas the Big Bang singularity is a past singularity. And the Weyl curvature hypothesis is saying that these things actually behave very differently. And a black hole has a horizon you can't escape from, but the, the, uh, the Big Bang has, well, the Big Bang has what's called a particle horizon. What the black hole has is what's called an event horizon. And these are the opposite way around in time. Particle horizon is, if you like, the past version of an event horizon. So what you're saying is, is appropriate, but we have to you know, get the terms right, that the black hole things are the other way around in time. And in fact, for a long time, people emphasized the similarity between black hole singularities and the Big Bang. They said, well, they're basically the same thing. It's just one's in the future, the other's in the past. But now, what I'm pointing out or stressing here, I've pointed out before, but I'm stressing again here, is that the structure geometrically is very different. It's not just the time reverse, and this has to do with the second law. It's, in fact, crucial. It's the whole basis of the second law of thermodynamics, that what starts is very, very constrained. And the singularities in the future are quite general, completely general. And the vile curvature is likely to diverge and oscillate and do completely wild things in the future singularities up here. Whereas the Big Bang, apparently, as we, as we know from the observations of the universe, the, uh, the vile curvature seems to be very small, or perhaps zero. And uh, this scheme is trying to make that into a, a more global picture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to need to cut this off at some point. Um, but let's go. On, go ahead. There, yeah. we'll go over here in a minute. Uh, I don't think this is really touched on in your We're not going to be able to do all these questions, guys. So. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I was wondering about your twister theory and um, what the significance would be of being able to map geometric objects in Minkowski space and into a four-dimensional complex space. Now, I was wondering whether this would be similar to a Hilbert space used in quantum me uh, mechanics. I think probably I should... Uh Leave. I mean, it is. A, it's. I mean, I love to answer questions like that, but it's about a different subject, and so probably I shouldn't. Yeah. The only thing I would say about twister theory is that it is very geared to conformal geometry. So it might well be, and, and twister theory in the in this cosmological context hasn't been much studied. Uh, it may well be that it would be an appropriate vehicle for describing some of these things. You need to read the book. That's as far as I can go. Okay. It's in Road, Road to Reality to addresses. I mean, clearer right now. Okay, thank so. you. So uh, go ahead. One more over here, and I think we're gonna uh, this one. And then we gotta wrap it because we're late already. So. All right. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Professor Pratt and Rose. I was wondering, kind of a trivial question. Could you please explain the um, time uh, integral from uh, integral from a to b of the function ds? I believe. Yes. Well, if you're familiar with the notion of a metric as applied in relativity theory, you have this quantity ds. Yes, it was this picture I think you're referring to. Yes. And if you have a curve, then the integral of ds, this is, the, you see the ds, you'd have some formula, ds squared equals something, some expression. And if you take the square root of that, in other words ds, and you integrate that along the curve from a to b, that tells you directly the clock time as measured by the clock following that world line. So if you have an ideal clock, and we now have clocks which are extraordinarily precise now, uh, nuclear clocks, for instance, uh, they actually do measure this metric in a very direct, precise way. But this is one reason, I think, for regarding space-time geometry is what sometimes called chronometry. This was a point of view very much emphasized by Bondi and by uh, Singh, uh, that it's best not to think of space-time metric in terms of little rulers, you see. This is a people tend to think about metric as you think of laying a lot of rulers around your space. But what's much more direct and physical is to think of time-like curves, in other words, the paths of possible particles, and the time as experienced by that particle between two events on that curve is given precisely by this integral. So integral of ds, which is the square root of that formula there, from a to b. And it's a very simple formula directly telling you uh, how the metric gives you some immediate physical quantity. Simpler level, you brought up the, depicted the uh, glass falling off the table. 
uh, which brought up the paradox of the uh, direction of the arrow of time. Uh, Ilya Prigozhin has been it's working on that, and I wondered what the, uh, the uh, ordinary physicist nowadays is thinking about Prigogine's uh, solution to that based on non-equilibrium systems, chaos and yeah. so on. Well, I'm not an expert on Prigogine's point of view. As far as I'm aware, um, he did take the view that, in some sense, physics was not actually time symmetrical on a small scale. Now, it's not part of anything I've been saying today, but uh, in some sense, I would have a view that's not dissimilar from that. But it's only, it's, it is different in detail from what he's saying. My view would be that somehow it's the um, measurement aspect of quantum mechanics which gives you a time which is not reversible in time. The physics, most of the physics we know at this micro scale is reversible in time. And I would take a conventional view with regard to uh, the arrow of time, as we call it, that is the entropy increase, and that that, that is not a local phenomenon, that it's, it's governed by boundary conditions. So I'm saying it's to do with the very special nature of the Big Bang, and that that drives it. But in addition to that, I would expect to see some asymmetry in the quantum state reduction process. But that hasn't come into what I was saying here. But it should. It ties in with this picture, I'm sure. But it's, it's not been something I've referred to, I'm afraid, here. I suspect that they're very similar. There we go. Anyway, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. We've got to run because we're late. And thank you. Uh, the, the coup de grace of this uh, of this dinner is that now that we have uh, you know poured some wine down him and uh, you know filled him up, he's feeling very satisfied. He was lean and mean at the lecture, but now we've got him you know sort of uh, vulnerable, so you can ask him the really you know the deep questions and the uh, and, uh, or deeper questions or maybe not so deep questions. So uh, so that's it. So. Uh, Sir Roger, if you come up here, we'll... And if you're asking me what, what I really think, I mean, that's too strong. It's a proposal. <laughs> it's a proposal which uh, I would say has a better chance. Uh, and when I say it's, not, it's never meant to be a metaphor or, or a... I mean, these, these are meant to be theories which might apply to the world. I'm not saying that it does, you see, because it could run into some fundamental roadblock which would just show it doesn't work. Now, that's quite possible. It's not something which I have as much confidence in as I have in some other ideas that I've suggested. But nevertheless, I think it's something worth talking about and which uh, is, as I think I said, the only scheme that I know of which really requires some form of vial curvature hypothesis, which is, in my view, a real, really fundamental puzzle about the universe. It's, it's one which hardly anybody talks about. If you look at cosmologies and you look at theories of the Big Bang and this and that, they hardly ever mention this issue. But the very, very, it's a very, very big puzzle how it is that this initial state had this extraordinary precision about it. And so this proposal at least attacks that question. Doesn't mean that it's right. It could be there are fundamental problems. Uh, the fact that you require charged massless particle, for instance, is, is a bit of a mouthful or whatever it is. <laughs> But uh, so I'm not saying I believe it. Um, there are other schemes which I've been associated with which I'd be more likely to say I believe it than this one. On the other hand, I think it's got a chance of being... Okay, I mean, it, ha it has experimental... Um, there are uh, things which could at least in principle be tested by experiment. And so it could be clearly refuted or it could be that these experiments support the idea. Uh, it does depend also on the constants of nature not changing from one cycle to the next, which uh, raises other issues which people talk about, the anthropic principle and are the constants of nature specially geared so that life can come about and so on. So there are lots of issues it's connected with. But I think it's, a, it's something 
maybe you can treat it as, a, as something for discussion. I think that's at least one can do. I think it has a chance of being something more serious than that. But I'm not saying that it's, that it's the whole truth or anything like this. I mean, that would be certainly not what I'm claiming. It's not even a theory with, based with a good equation. I mean, like Einstein's, Einstein's general relativity has equations, you see. It, and you can test to see whether those equations really are satisfied in the world uh, that, we, that we know. Whereas this scheme of mine is severely lacking in things like that. It needs a lot of work before it even has that kind of foundation. So at the moment, it's just an idea. Yeah, and, and I guess my question really is at the heart of it. I, I, I'm a psychologist and I experimental. And I see. I've never had the privilege of working really at the edge. I've had the privilege of working with people yeah. who are on the edge. I'm trying to understand the nature of cosmology and is it really a lot of, a few of you on the edge coming up with ideas and is saying, hey, I've got an idea. How far can this carry us? I'm trying to understand the, the, well, human nature, the human component of the progress in cosmology. I don't know whether, I don't know whether, <laughs> I mean, I've, I know some cosmologists who rather disappointed me. I, I won't mention names here, but there was a cosmologist who I challenged and asked whether, why this person was putting forward a certain view, which seemed, sorry? There was no bet, no, there was no bet. I was asking why he put forward a certain viewpoint which seemed like a rather strange one to me. And the response was that a viewpoint that he'd been promoting earlier had a chance of being experimentally refuted by some observation. And so he had to have something in reserve. I thought this was rather shocking, you see, because it seemed to me one's trying to find out what, what, how the world ticks. That's, that's what one's trying to do. One's trying to find out um, you know, how the world is constructed, what is, what's going on out there. And uh, to have a, a a different theory in reserve in case the observations didn't go the way you hoped originally. It didn't seem to be the right point of view. It seemed to be a strange attitude. So, I mean, yeah, I feel one, what one is trying to do is, is, to, is to find out what the world's like, what's out there, why is it out there, why is it doing what it's doing. Um, it's, 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 that's, that's the aim, certainly. It's not producing models which might excite, might get into the New York Times or something like that. It's producing models which uh, one thinks might have a serious chance of representing reality. Mm. It's not supposed to be, it's not written to be easy, if you like. Well, it is to some degree, because I could have written a really difficult book, which... <laughs> 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 no, the equations are there because they're there. I mean, these, these, I'm not you know, putting equations in to make the book more difficult. I'm putting equations because that's the way to explain certain things. And the mathematics is there in the world. If one's going to understand how the world ticks, uh, one has to relate it, it to mathematics. I mean, that seems to be no escape. I mean, that we don't know any other way of understanding nature at any kind of deep level. So it's not that I put it there. If you like, nature did. I'm trying to... Uh, I'm not, you know, putting all the details. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's supposed to give, to give some idea of, of how, um, you know, the, the kinds of mathematics that, that underlie our, at least what we think, understand basic, the basis of nature so far. I, so it's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's some places where I put bits of mathematics in just because I thought they were fun and not because they were really essential for the book. There are a few places like that. Uh, and, but in a sense, that's fine, because you see, uh, mathematics ought to be fun. Um, there are other places where I skimped on the mathematics, where perhaps I could have been a bit more serious about it. Um, it was just sometimes I had to make a choice as to which to do. And I put in these problems because often it was well, I, it was for two reasons. One was, I suppose, slightly, I suppose I thought that maybe it would be used in courses, and I know that people like to have <laughs> examples in books that are used in courses, but there's a more serious reason, and that is that in explaining things, I often found that, okay, I could explain this at this point, but if I did, it would simply detract from the thread of argument. And so I said, well, maybe there's enough information here for somebody to work it out for themselves. So I would give it as, as an example. And it was just a sort of device for easing the writing. That those things, 
the things that are set in problems are almost always things that would be useful to know anyway, and then I could have put them in the text, um, the, the knowledge level was enough to explain them, but it seemed to me it would be distracting for the reader, and that it was better you know, to put them in a, in a problem. Now, in there you see, okay, the reader can either ignore them completely or else look at the problem and take it on trust, uh, or, or do it. So in the best possible world, in the best possible world, the reader will be interested in the text. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's that's fine. Yeah. Yes. Isn't it still true that, that on very short time scales there, there are quantum fluctuations which would establish a metric on a, on a small scale at least? I don't know. It's certainly true that um, when you try to quantize, say, a conformally invariant theory, you tend to find that you can't preserve the, I mean, it's this sort of issue of anomalies, where the classical theory has certain symmetries and you may find that the quantum theory, you're forced into, into violating these symmetries. So that can happen. Uh, but there's also something strange has to happen about quantum mechanics in this scheme. I mean, the, the view would be that in the remote future, when the densities of these uh, fields become so, so uh, feeble, so weak, so small, um, that in fact the quantum nature of the fields becomes less and less relevant. So not only does mass some, somehow become unimportant, but the, the quantum nature also becomes unimportant. Because somehow you have to rescale the quantum, the quantum scale needs rescaling as well. Mainly because the phase space volume has a natural measure. See, this is a problem that I encountered, that, that the phase space of the, of the entire universe, if the previous phase, roughly speaking, has to fit in the region of the Big Bang of the next universe. Now, on conventional physics viewpoint, there is a natural measure to phase space, which is given, if you like, by Planck's constant, because you have a dp dq, the, mo the position momentum thing. And uh, there is a natural measure, which in terms of h-bar or something. So in order to be able to put the whole phase space into this small region, the universe also has to leave, lose track of the quantum scale. So it's not just the metric. And this is one of the things that I find a little bit, well, it needs more thinking about. So h bar gets towards zero, becoming more classical. Well, somehow, yes. That once the, when, the, when the fields become very dispersed, that in effect they become fields, and the quantum nature of them is lost. But then you've got to see how on the other side, this uh, somehow scales, fits in with, with a different quantum scale. It needs thinking about seriously, and I, don't, I wouldn't say I thought all that through. But uh, it is an important point. Yeah. Meter, uh, in your talk, you talked, I mean, your, your whole idea was to talk about what happened before the Big Bang. And in a sense, you inflated by saying a Big Bang occurs, and then that goes through that cycle, and another one occurs, and then another one occurs, and it goes on. So my question is, OK. What happens before any of those things happen? <laughs> uh, that was, yes. Was it always a fluctuating state? That there never was a beginning? Or what's beyond that beyond? You can ask that question. And I was, if I, I had a sort of weeding out of transparencies before I gave this talk. And I think the one that was going to respond to that question, I weeded out. Because somebody else had asked a question, which was very like that one. The first question, I think. And, uh, in fact, you can, it depends, up to that point, it doesn't make much difference in my scheme which value of the curvature there is. I mean, you can have k positive, negative, or zero, and the picture looks very similar. But if you want to represent the entire, you can represent the entire family of cycles as a part of a conformal, you can represent conformally as a part of a, what's called the sitter space. 
And, and you can then ask, okay, where does all that come from? So there's a sort of second order question you can ask. The cycle goes on and on and on, but in some sense you could say, uh, is there an origin to the whole thing? Well, it is a sort of turtles all the way down question, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not unlike steady state model, you see. It, yeah. But you're right, I mean, there is that issue, and I, and I don't deny it. I mean, elsewhere than in the places we know it. Well, do you see any evidence that mind or consciousness arrives within the universe? Well, I hope it's present in, in most well, people here. Yes. Some people seem to feel that the, uh, it's the other way around, that the physical universe is a precipitate of... Yes, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, you could read these things in other directions, but I prefer to think of it as that the physical universe is out there and the potential for consciousness is out there. It doesn't mean that a rock possesses... Well, you see, it depends on... Uh, you need to have a better theory. Maybe the conscious a rock possess, possesses 0. 0.000000 something units of consciousness or something, I have no idea, uh, and that a human being possesses many more units. But on the other hand, maybe a rock doesn't have any, you see. Uh, on the other hand, you can ask questions about, uh, well, a cat, you see, well, that's relevant to the Schrodinger's cat, of course, or a mouse, or a snail, or an amoeba. Uh, these questions you can ask at all sorts of levels. Well, and who knows the answer at the moment? You, you can also uh, uh, think that perhaps consciousness is evenly distributed throughout the universe. Well, I wouldn't the take that view. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that that's a somewhat unhelpful view. I mean, you would say it's floating around in the room somewhere and there's as much of it over there as there is over here or over there or something. I find that not very helpful in the sense that the only thing we have, the only way we have to relate to consciousness is through um, we communicating with other people and seeing how they re correspond to our own feelings of awareness and so on and we do our best. But uh, I would say that there's not much evidence that a rock has much of this quality, if any. Well, I, I don't know of any experiment you can do. Yes, but you have to use, at our present level of understanding, you have to use a good measure of common sense, I would say. So it's, you, you, you might be right. I mean, maybe a rock has, no con has, has just as much consciousness as a, well, as a human being of the same size. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry? It may be in the nature of an irrefutable argument, because you say Yeah. I think at our present stage of understanding, we need to make guesses about this. And that's the way it works. I mean, in, in uh, you know, there's what philosophers call the problem of other minds. I mean, how do we know that anybody else has awareness and so on? Okay, you can say that, but it's not, knowing is too strong. You say you guess. And the guess is, is based. It's not a, it's not a completely guess plucked out of the sky. It's, you know, it's, it's people react in certain ways which seem to be consistent with the way one acts oneself under certain circumstances. When one seems to feel conscious, one behaves in certain ways and other people behave in that way sometimes and you think they're probably conscious at that time. It seems to be a reasonable... It's not a proof of anything. I'm not saying this is a, demonst a rigorous demonstration of anything, but it's a pretty good guess, I would say. Not yet. I would say this is a potential issue that... I have a student working on this and I wish he'd, he'd hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know the answer at the moment, but I, I, my guess is that there are... there may be some parameters which have to be sorted out, but my guess is that there is a fairly clear prediction that this theory would give. One can certainly estimate how many black holes there are hanging around out there and uh, make some crude estimate as to how much radiation would be produced over the whole of history of the universe as we know it. And maybe one could relate that to some primordial gravitational radiation in, in the next phase. 
And we have to assume that the previous phase was like ours and that the constants of nature haven't radically changed since then. So I'm not enthusiastic about these theories in which the constants of nature change, because if they do, basically all bets are off in this scheme. But I think uh, the first thing to try, at least, is to assume they don't change and to try and make some good estimate on the basis of what we think the remote future would be like. But these calculations have not yet been done, so I don't know the answer in detail. And whether the, they would be anything within the range that Lisa could, could find, I, I just don't know. Yeah, I, I, was, I was interested in how uh, information gets, um, how much in, information gets uh, crossed from one to the next. Yeah. Through, through the renormalization process. You know, your diagram yeah. showed gravitational waves. Yes. That well, that's. Yes. Remarkably, that's fairly well defined. And the reason has to do with uh, what's well, a sort of curious um, feature of the transformations, which, which I noticed a long time ago but couldn't quite see what the role was, which has to do with how, how um, the vial curvature scales and how the gravitational radiation scales. And what you see is that in the remote future, the the gravitational radiation, the equations that are satisfied by, by gravitational radiation, if you like, are basically conformally invariant. But they're conformally invariant with a different scale factor from the sense in which the vial curvature is conformally invariant, which means that the radiation, as it goes out and sort of hits infinity, if you like, it has a finite value, which, which is perfectly fine. I mean, it, it, the equations just carry it out and, hit, and it hits it with its finite value. But the vial curvature scales to zero at that point. And that zero scale has to go over to the other side, which gives you the vial curvature hypothesis. But the, vial, the gravitational radiation goes right through. And, and it's, it's, uh, the mathematics seems to me at least fairly clear. And it should, uh, all one needs to do is make the right estimates as to, as to how much radiation should be around. And the uh, conclusion as to how much radiation should come out the other side is pretty unambiguous. Um, also, the amount of density fluctuations on the other side, it seemed to me to be pretty unambiguous. But I'm speaking a little bit out of, out of turn here because the detailed calculations have not yet been done and but it remains to be you seen. Did have then a, a, some progressive accumulation from renormalization and renormalization and renormalization. Uh, if, if yeah. We, if we have some clues, say, from looking at yeah. the Yes. The question is, do, does, it, <laughs> does it come root even to the next phase after this? Or could yeah. conscious <laughs> beings, you know, direct, yes. direct the information for the yes. next It's funny because uh, one of the papers which um, I, it's very relevant to this whole subject was written in the 1990s by Freeman Dyson when he was interested in the future of, of um, future of, of intelligence. I, th I can't remember what the title was, but he was at that time looking at the remote future according to what seemed at that time to be the most promising model for the universe. That had a zero cosmological constant, but had negative curvature, and that was a feature of the low density of matter. I think dark matter was known, but certainly not. The, what is now called dark energy, in other words, the cosmological constant, that was not known. And I did email him at one time and ask him what the present view was, and he emailed me back and said, well, all the conclusions in that paper are wrong <laughs> because of the cosmological constant. And he said, he referred me some other people who had actually done these calculations later on. But he was interested in, in how somehow intelligent life might be able to persist and no, you know, even though the density would go right and right down, that somehow they could keep themselves going in the remote future. A very interesting idea, but there may be an extension of this idea. It was very much like what you're saying. You could imagine somehow some remote in future intelligence where they would control the motions of black, bo black holes and so on and make them spow around in ways which encode you know, some great piece of music or whatever it is. <laughs> and that somehow this is out there in the next phase of the universe. One could write a science fiction story about that, I should imagine. <laughs>
but uh, it seems a bit remote possibility. But maybe, maybe the information will get through to the phase beyond the one that we... It's something which I hadn't really thought through. <laughs> but uh, I suppose I'd sort of thought that it would get lost somehow on the web. But uh, maybe that's not right, I don't know. So the questions are whether, yeah. the, whether the, um, the structure of our, our the, uh, present, uh, the complexity of our present have evolved from uh, the conditions that we have yeah. in this one, or whether you need yes, information yes, from yeah. that previous boundary condition. Well, yes. Well, you see, there's an interesting question, which is where do these fluctuations come from? And the sort of view that people express, they talk about quantum fluctuations. And in the inflationary models, that's the type, kind of language that's used. I have a lot of trouble with this, because quantum fluctuations don't actually come about unless you have state reduction. See, they should all be in superposition, all these things. And somehow they've got to resolve, <coughs> excuse me, you have to resolve one reality out of the potential and, and some of these issues aren't addressed properly in any of these models, as far as I can see. So you need some scheme which actually solves the quantum measurement problem before you can even really talk about the that. Soul. Well, you can call it that. <laughs> I'm, keeping, I'm keeping clear of that uh, point of view. <laughs> yes. Well, that again, actually there's different kinds of versions of multi-universes. The one which maybe you're referring to is what people sometimes refer to as the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, where you have in that view various different alternatives coexisting. The trouble is it's not really what happens in quantum mechanics. They're in superposition. They're not alternatives. And so how you... I've never quite understood how that's supposed to work. But, um, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a point of view that's often expressed. You also have multi-universes in other <coughs> points of view, namely which connected with the anthropic principle. You say the constants of nature might have a different value. Maybe there's a parallel universe out there in which the constants of nature have a different value. And one of the ways of coming to terms with the fact that maybe the constants na of nature are, are just right so that life can happen, which is a thing that worries many people, one solution to that would be, well, there are lots of different universes all sort of parallel to each other, and we happen to find ourselves in one in which life could exist, because we couldn't find ourselves in any of the others. So uh, it's a sort of tautology, if you like. But it does, in a sense, require these alternative universes somehow to exist out there. Uh, my own view is I don't like any of these multi-universes. I don't like the quantum mechanical one because I don't think it solves the measurement paradox. And uh, it seems to me a very uh, extravagant uh, non-solution to the problem. Because you really need a, a theory of why conscious being only perceives one universe and so on. And that's not part of their theory, is it, as far as I can see. Uh, so it doesn't really solve the measurement paradox as yet. Maybe a different scheme version of it might. It doesn't, uh, I have a lot of trouble with the other version, which is where you have these constants of nature having to have other values. Um, particularly, it's not such good news for my scheme because it would mean maybe these things get r changed at each cycle, in which case we have a lot of trouble making predictions in the scheme. But maybe they do. One needs to have a deeper understanding of nature. I, I, I can't rule them out. If you take the anthropic one, the arguments tend to be things like uh, if we didn't have the, the neutron being slightly more massive than the proton, <coughs> then you might have trouble with having proper chemistry and so on. And there are things about water. If water was, the parameters were slightly different, then ice wouldn't be lighter than water. And for some reason, that causes problems. I'm not quite sure what. But my difficulty with all these things is that we really have no idea what the preconditions for conscious beings are. Um, if they didn't come, if consciousness didn't come about in the way that we know, maybe it could have come about in some completely different way, which of which we have no conception whatsoever. So it's very hard to to argue very strongly about these things. You certainly find that people take refuge in the 
anthropic argument very much. They say, you know, their theories don't predict the values of the constants. So they say, well, maybe there are all these different universes and where these different values of the constants hold. I'm not very happy with those theories. I, I can't say they're wrong, but I'm not happy with them.